Hi there, this is Jean Pierre Ruth for Information Week. And in this episode of Das One Hunt, we are looking a bit what we're calling beyond the election. The election I'm sure everyone is aware of, one way or the other. Uh, we're looking at it from the idea of tech directives for technology developers and organizations themselves. Because one way or the other, regardless of what spectrum you're on in the political landscape, there's going to be a new administration coming to the United States. And that might bring changes in terms of, uh, you know, the executive leadership, uh, making decisions, uh, agency leadership. There might be people coming and going. There might be new directions. And that might mean that there are new things that organizations might need to speak to, answer to, have to have, you know, ways to adapt and to, to, to work with potentially regulators or work with new understandings for how these different branches, how, the, how these branches of government might work. So again, brought together some folks who are much smarter than me, who are you know, ready to talk about this. Today I'm joined by Pierre Dubois, founder of Zimana. Thank you coming back again onto the show. And also joined by Gary Bartlett, public sector CTO for Illumio. Gentlemen, thank you both for being on the show today. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Great to be here. Okay, great. So let's kick this off um, by looking at, you know, again, with the change that's going to come on the national level for the for executive leadership, uh, how much federal policy regulation uh, might affect technology use and 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 Gary, I was hoping you can speak speak to this. You know, with this change that's coming, you know, how much are you foreseeing that there's going to be uh, a change, and how much might this will affect uh, the way enterprises and you know developers um, might you know approach what they're doing, or at least take some time to think, like, okay, we kind of need to be ready for something. Yeah. So I think. Um... You know, obviously we go through this, you know, periodically, right? We get new administrations coming in and the, the same question gets asked, right? Um, honestly, I think right now with the landscape that we're currently facing and some of the directives that are that agencies are currently following, I'm not personally forecasting this huge upheaval. Um, I think there might be potentially some minor nuanced changes, right? Maybe some deadlines will change. Uh, maybe some terminology will change. But when you look at the, the current executive orders and the current directives that agencies are, are operating under, um, you know, they really encompass zero trust, which has gotten a really strong foothold across the industry, both inside government and outside government, right? Uh, so I really don't see a new administration coming in and, and doing a, you know, a complete left turn uh, and going in a, you know, 90 degree turn and going in a completely different direction again. Uh, there might be some variations, some, some minor adjustments, but honestly, um, I think that the, the train is heading down the track um, and, and I'm not foreseeing really any major disruptions in, in that path. Gotcha, gotcha. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Pierre, uh, historically, has there, how much has federal policy and regulation really affected technology and operations by enterprises and organizations? Have they had like a really, uh, you know, there are certain policies and certain certain things that are still you know very much in the works where policy is trying to catch up to technology but how how significant of a role has that had on the way enterprises and other organizations might have like approached you know the way they've been going forward or trying to de develop and go forward uh, it's definitely i think it's easy to say that um, technology is somehow it's kind of almost led um, a lot of government response uh, to technology is it's almost like government's really kind of playing catch up. We, we're still sitting, in, it's, it's coming into 2025 and we're still sitting without a national data uh, privacy policy. And now on top of that, we're facing with AI. But having said that, uh, the strides that, um, I know the Trump administration, there was a executive order on AI during Trump's um, time. And then there was also an executive order during Biden's time. And to what Gary's point is, there's been some uh, uh, executive interest and enough where they have brought in uh, the execs from who are leading at AI now. So there's a lot of push that's coming and it has been developing for a while. It, I, I'm hoping it means that no matter who comes into the office, it, we won't take the left turn. And I agree with Gary, there's probably not, that's probably, chances of that happening has to be something along the lines of a major event to 
change things around. But having said that, I think the biggest, I think the influence where government has been uh, placed in the technology has been gradual and maybe, and that actually may be an advantage because there's so many things in technology that it feels fast, but you don't want government to act to over respond to the technology, particularly in cases that uh, where technology may not last out the way that you think it will. I mean, let's face it, you don't want a you don't want anyone passing a law against Betamax in 2025, basically anytime soon. But we do need to have, I think now I think the influence has been gradual, and I think that has been beneficial for both government in terms of planning direction and for technology companies in terms of planning their directions as well too and how to respond to that. Gotcha. That's great. Thank you very much for that. Um, now for both of you, um, again, really, you know, leading off of that, um, there, there are different levels, different layers of policy uh, that, that can come into play. You know, there's you know, actual laws, uh, agencies and regulators, and then there's, you know, executive orders that can come directly from, you know, from, you know pen from the desk of the president. And how much weight, um, from what you've seen, have executive orders had on technology and its use and its operations. Um, I'm speaking to, you know, to, to executive orders because of the idea is that the executive orders have a tendency to be a bit more immediate in their you know drafting and then their appearance and then now it's going into action versus the the various ways that you know other layers of policy you know be it laws that have to you know go through uh you know various negotiations uh, through committees uh even uh, when regulators try to you know establish rules there you know there might be a public comment period what have you um but executive orders they could be like i've drafted this and so mode it be <laughs> so i move well, i get a sense from from what we have seen already you know across various administrations how much weight have they had on the way technology has been, uh, again, used, operated, developed? Yeah, so I, I'll start with that one. So um, I was a federal CIO for 10 years, so I was on the receiving end of executive orders. Um, so on one hand, uh, uh, you look at them and go, hey, this is great, right? Because oftentimes when I'm sitting in the room with you know the other executives of an agency, it's not the, hey, Gary wants to do this great idea, right? It's really nice when I can point to a letter from the president and go, hey, the president of the United States is telling us we should go do something, right? Uh, so it's really uh, advantageous, right, when there is an executive order like that that you can point to because uh, it really gives some validity uh, if you're really pushing hard to try to get something done. On the flip side, you know, traditionally executive orders are unfunded mandates, right? They come out with these great ideas because it's easy to sit in an office and sign a piece of paper. You're not worried about how you're going to pay to do whatever it is you're just telling people to do. Uh, you know, so that sometimes then, you know, it's the other side of the coin is it becomes a burden because all of a sudden you've got these directives you got to go do and there's finite amount of money, right? They don't come with funding. Uh, so it's really a double-edged sword, right? Sometimes you can use it to your advantage and point to it and say, hey, look, really, you should give me some money for this, right? This was something that I wanted to do, but now the president's saying we should go do it. Uh, but oftentimes the agency heads go, it's great the president saying go do this, but he didn't give me any money to do it, so it really can't be that important. So it's kind of a really interesting dynamic. I would agree with Gary on that quite a bit. I think the on the surface, the executive order, you know, from a public's point of view, it serves as a response to something that needs to be done. But the budgeting is a big part of it, and I think for the administration, it's it, I think makes the difference in how the executive order is accepted. When you looked at what um, uh, between Trump and versus uh, Biden, um, there's 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 some differences, and those differences play in in terms of just their administration style and the teams that they built around them, um, and that leads into the larger discussion of yes, I'm writing this executive order and what sort of budgeting, what sort of consequential actions come from it. Uh, so there can be, I think the difference really comes into uh, not with the executive order, but with the administration and the, and the entire team that's been built around it that kind of influences where the private sector responds. And I think Gary brings up a good point of, if you're going to be an executive order, there needs to be something behind that. And there may be some things, honestly, that, that probably should not be in an executive order. It probably really should be codified into a law where there's where people can plan budgets and plan resources accordingly to make something much more successful. Gotcha, gotcha. And actually, speaking of 
uh, you know, the, the administrations themselves, uh, you know, next question, you know, looking at new a new you know executive leadership comes in uh, at the federal level uh, you know the white house that can mean you know a, a change of the guard in those agencies and departments uh, you know and there's a potential um, you know with those changes that there might be some loss or at least alter or change of the tech tech knowledge that is part of those agencies at least from the top um, also potentially with some policymakers, but is that a concern? Um, you know, could there, you know, if there's, if there, when there's such a shift that, that it can make things more difficult for tech creators and enterprises uh, to really relate to these agencies, to these departments, to these offices, uh, if, you know, whoever it is that then, then it's, you know, the change of the guard and then you, you don't, they're, they can be varying in their expertise, knowledge, and just understanding of where things are at. Is that a concern? Is that something where there might be at some time of like hand holding to try and get to know you and also try to get across to them, you know, how a particular technology or how a particular industry works? Yeah, so so I would say yes. Uh, there 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 is concern, right? Anytime you have any kind of change at the top. Um, there's always, you know, uh, you know, there's a lot of re-explaining that has to be done. Like when you're in the, the middle layers or right, you got to go in and re-explain oftentimes new leaders come in and go, Hey, I want to put a pause on everything until, you know, give me six months, right? Give me the infamous, give me six months to figure out, really figure out what's going on and figure out what's important. And, and that can really have a significant impact on trying to get, especially from a technology deployment perspective, right? You're just about to close on the procurement. I had this happen to me just about to close on a procurement of a project I've been working years to get put in place. And a, a new boss walks in the door and says, well, time out, right? You know, that's a lot of money. I need to understand this. And then, you know, all of a sudden this thing that I was just really ready to go on uh, is suddenly kicked down the road. You know, it literally got kicked down the road six months. Um, so it can really have a significant impact, right? And that just shows that, that you know, that, that strength of leadership at the top has such a, a critical role uh, with IT, right? And you always want to have the most successful IT programs have senior leadership buy-in and support, right? So when you swap out those components, you got to start that all over again, uh, oftentimes, and I'll say most times. I, I don't like absolutes. That's why I'll say often or most. Uh, but but I, I but I really think that it, we always see, a, you know, turbulence after any kind of administration change. And it doesn't matter if parties change or not, right? This is not a party thing. This is just a leadership change, right? So because a lot of people will swap out for various reasons, hey, I've done this long enough, uh, you know, or I wasn't asked to stay on or whatever the reasons may be, there's always significant change after an election. Uh, and that change has down downstream effects. I would, I would, yeah, I, I like what Greg, Gary brought up about the whole idea of planning out a project for years and then at last minute someone could come in and, and say no. Um, we kind of have a very interesting dynamic with this election in that, yes, we're getting a new administration, but both candidates, there's a familiarity that um, that industry has with both candidates. Uh, there's, there's people who are familiar with what Trump did during his term. And then uh, Kamala Harris, uh, if you look at some of the things that, that went in in terms of the executive order, uh, and the meeting that happened with the tech uh, leaders, she was pretty much the, I, I don't want to call her a program manager or something like that, but there's kind of like this program manager role relative to the president uh, in that uh, there was some visibility there. And I, I honestly think, um, I think the fact that with both candidates that there is some familiarity is why that the tech companies, uh, they know that something new is coming, but at the same time, there's sort of a calmness to it. And I think it, it would be radically different if it was somebody radically different coming in um, as an administration. So I think that I think that sort of balance is there for people in, in particular right now. I think that that's being factored into a lot of the responses that we see at this point. Yeah, it's a very it's a very unique uh, situation, right? I mean, this is not the norm, uh, right? So to Pierre's point that uh, there is familiarity with both sides, right? So it's not a, there's no it's not a complete unknown like it normally is, right? So uh, yeah, it's gonna, it's a very interesting time. To listen to the entire conversation, look for the DOS 100 podcast on Spreaker, Spotify, Amazon Music, and other popular podcast platforms.